We've just reached our 200th day of lockdown in Melbourne, so I thought to celebrate, why not go over one of my favorite lockdown activities, scanography. For those people who haven't done scanography before, it involves using a scanner rather than a camera to take photos. And there are some unique things we can do with the technology behind the scanner to give us some really cool effects. The unique thing about the scanner is that it records image line by line. So each line that it records is a separate moment in time. And this is different to the camera's sensor, which would record every moment in time equally over all those pixels. Because of this, if we move an object while we're doing a scan, we can create some really interesting looking images. And there's a whole heap of potential here for creative applications. Today's video is gonna be more of a technical guide, I call it my ultimate guide to scanography. And what I really wanna show you is all the different techniques you can use to create interesting images yourself. I'll make sure that I put chapters on the video, so if you're already a bit familiar with some of the topics we cover, just skip to the next one and look at the content that's relevant to you. Let's first talk about the kind of files that you can actually record. And there are a couple of different settings that you might wanna alter depending on what you wanna do with the actual images. Uh, so the first one is your file type, and there are two common file types you'll find, which will be either JPEG or TIFF. Now both of these have their pros and cons. JPEGs will be a more compressed image, so you'll have smaller files. Uh, it's also a more standardized format, so you could easily take those photos, share them on Instagram, Facebook, uh, send them on email, all that sort of stuff, without having to do any editing or conversion. However, because they are smaller compressed files, they don't have as much data as what a TIFF does. So if you're wanting to do large scale prints, you know, make really serious artworks with this stuff, then I'd recommend going with TIFF. It's just gonna mean that you're using up a lot more hard drive space and you'll probably need to use some more specialized software to play around with them, like Photoshop or something along those lines. The other thing you can control is the DPI. Now you'll notice in my Epson scan software here, there's, there's lots of options, but we don't really need to go through all of these and most of the other options can just be fine tuned once we get to the editing stage anyway. The DPI, however, controls the resolution of our image. The higher the DPI, the more pixels we'll have, which will mean we'll be able to print larger and also crop in more if we're wanting to do that once we edit. The other thing with DPI is that it's gonna change the speed at which our scanner scans. And we'll see once we start to go and do some movements, being able to control how quickly or slowly the scanner scans can really help us be more precise with the alterations to the image that we're wanting to make. Once you've chosen those couple of things from your files, then you can get to actually scanning. But the first thing you wanna do is give your scanner a bit of a clean, uh, particularly if you're using grimy and grubby stuff, your scanner will get pretty dirty pretty quick. And that just means more things to try and clean up once you get into the editing stage. So I always give my scanner a wipe down every time I use it. And what I use is just isopropyl alcohol, which you can get from any sort of office supply store and also some lint-free cloth, which I got from a camera shop. If you're doing things with your hands or with some sort of oily or greasy material, you'll probably find you need to give it a few wipes before you actually get it clean. So what I would do is give it a wipe, do a preview, have a look to see if there are any smudges or marks left. If there are, do another preview and just repeat that process till it looks clean. You can see on my scanner here, it's getting pretty beat up. So there are a few scratches and a few marks that just won't come out. That's fine, I can take care of them once I get the image into Photoshop at the end. Okay, now let's get into the fun stuff where we actually start to record an image. The first thing we'll talk about is what I call the standard image, and this is the most boring one or the most basic one, and it involves putting something on the scanner, hitting scan, and not doing anything at all. Now it's still worthwhile talking about this because you can get some really interesting photos with the scanner, particularly when you start to layer different objects on top of each other and treat it like a sort of digital collage. We wanna get a little bit beyond this today though, so let's talk about some different ways you can move an object on top of the scanner in order to create interesting effects. The first technique is called a stretch, and this involves moving an object with the sensor of the scanner, typically around about the same speed that the scanner is moving. What will happen is the scanner will record the same part of that object over and over and over again, and this will result in an elongated stretched effect. The next movement is called a reverse, and it's a similar motion to the stretch. However, this time, rather than moving with the sensor of the scanner, 
You want to actually move in the same direction, but at a quicker speed than what the scanner is moving. What this will do is create a mirror-like effect where an object is flipped around and shown in the opposite direction to what it's actually facing. Next on the list is a compress, and a compress involves moving the object in the opposite direction to what the scanner is going. What this will do is squish the object and create a compressed looking image. After this, we have something which will combine both the stretch and also the compress, and that's by doing a rotate. A rotate involves spinning an object around while it's being scanned. And this might give you a result that's not what you'd necessarily expect, but can create some really interesting shapes from your object. We can also move an object left to right while we're scanning, and this is something that's called a warp. A warp is probably my favorite effect, and it'll create this really fluid, liquidy looking motion as you move the object back and forth. Lastly, we have something called a relocate, which simply means scanning the object in one place and then moving it to a different position. This allows you to create multiple instances of that object over the entirety of the image. Now I mentioned before that you can change the DPI of the scanner and this will actually change the speed at which it scans. This can really help you when you're trying to do really precise movements on the glass of the flatbed and can give you a chance to have a little bit more control over how the final image looks. Have a look at this example comparing a warp done with a 300 DPI scan compared to an 800 DPI scan. Now the same movement was used in both of these photos, the same amount of movement and also the same speed but you can see the 800 dpi image looks a lot more erratic because it's had a longer period to capture that movement. You gotta be a little bit careful, this can be a bit of a double-edged sword because if you have your dpi too high and you're moving too quickly, you could just end up with a complete abstract mess and your object may actually not be discernible in the final photo. A relocate is also a really useful technique to have a high dpi because it gives you much more of a chance to pick something up and move it to a different position. But you can really use a high DPI for any of the movements we've talked about. If you find that the scanner is moving too quickly for the result that you're wanting to create, then just increase the DPI and this should fix it pretty quickly. Now, so far we've just looked at a two-dimensional object. However, we can also scan 3D objects and there's some pretty interesting effects we can get from these too. One of my favorite things about a scanner with a three-dimensional object is that we can actually capture it from different viewpoints. What I mean by this is when we take a photo with a regular camera, we're only capturing it from one viewpoint, and that's the direction that the camera is pointed towards. If you're wanting to photograph a cube, for example, you'll at most be able to capture three sides of that cube. With three-dimensional objects, however, we can actually move, rotate, and twist the object to capture it from multiple perspectives, which is a really unique thing to the scanner and one of the most interesting things to explore when you're making images. Scanners also have an interesting way of creating depth. They're typically only sharp really where the object is touching the glass. And as soon as something moves away from the glass, you'll actually start to get a really blurry soft focus very quickly. This can be really useful for drawing your attention to a particular part of the object and playing around with bits in focus and out of focus to create some really cool dimension to your image. You can also play around with two dimensional objects and depth as well just by lifting it off and on the glass of the scanner. However, I find this really excels when you're dealing in the third dimension. If you've been scanning under normal conditions, so maybe you're doing this in the middle of the day with a window open or you've got your room lights on, then you've probably noticed that all your scans are coming out with this really ugly gray background. And in my opinion, it's much better to have a pure white or a pure black background. So how do we achieve this? Well, to get the black background, what you wanna do is just make your room as dark as possible. So this might mean closing the blinds, turning off the lights, and even just waiting until nighttime to do your scans. The darker you get the room, the blacker that background will be. To get a white background, we wanna do the opposite to this. So we could potentially try and pump as much light as we could into the scanner, uh, but this is a little bit impractical and you'll probably find you still end up with an ugly looking gray. What you're better off doing is just putting something white behind your object and reflecting as much light back into the scanner as you can. So this just means using a white bit of paper or some white card or often your scanner will come with a white reflective thing that you can use too. And once we've got it to as white as possible, we can then adjust this once we get into Photoshop and make it pure white. We'll talk about the editing side of things towards the end and I'll give you a couple of tips. But before that, I wanna talk about the two different kinds of scanners that you might actually have. One kind of scanner is called a CIS sensor scanner, 
and you'll typically find this in the cheaper models, so your printer scanner combos or anything sub couple of hundred bucks is likely to be a CIS sensor scanner. On the higher end, scanners have CCD sensors, and you'll find these in scanners that are often compatible with scanning things like photographic negatives, or ones that go up to the hundreds or the thousand dollar range. There are a couple of differences between the two of them. One thing that's unique to the CCD sensors is that you can get this really cool effect where you get a misregistration of colors while you're moving an object around. This will create these sort of kaleidoscopic, psychedelic looking scans where you're getting cyan, magenta, and yellow colors all warped and changed. And it, it's one of my favorite things to do when creating images. You won't be able to get this effect with a CIS scanner. So if you really like it, it means you're gonna have to spend a little bit more and make sure that you're getting the right unit. CCD scanners also have a greater range of focus. So you'll actually find that things don't go out of focus as quickly with a CCD scanner as they do with a CIS scanner. Now I actually prefer the cheaper scanners, the CIS scanners for this effect. One, because I really like that soft focus effect from the CIS scanners, but also the CCD scanners tend to distort the image the further away it gets from the glass, whereas the CIS scanners still keep the same perspective and I think the end results look a lot nicer when you're trying to go for something blurry. The last difference between the two is how the different scanners capture projected light. A CIS scanner will capture projected light as black and white, whereas a CCD scanner will capture projected light in color. The easiest way to show the difference between the two of these is if I scan my phone screen. For the CIS scanner, I get a black and white screen, whereas the CCD scanner, I get it in color. This means if you're wanting to project or shine light into the scanner, or if you're wanting to capture some sort of screen like your phone or a computer screen, then you might wanna go for a CCD scanner so you can actually record those colors. Lastly, I just wanna talk about a couple of simple post-processing things you can do that'll really make a big difference into how the final scan looks. The first thing I'll always do is change my background to be either pure white or pure black. And this is really to do in Photoshop just by adding a levels or a curves layer and using the black or the white point eyedropper tool to select the background. The only time you need to be a little bit careful with this is if your object has similar tones to your background. So if you're capturing a bright object on a white background or a dark object on a black background, you might lose detail in the object doing this. So you'll need to add in some layer masks in order to make sure that your object isn't affected. The next thing I'll do is use a clone tool to remove the dust spots, the scratches, and also my hand from the final image. So I'm just left with the object, which is really what I'm wanting the viewer to focus on. This is also a good chance to play around with your crop and composition, either cropping in tighter or giving your object more space. It can be a little bit hard to get things perfect when you're scanning it as far as the positioning goes. So by changing your canvas size, you can play around with this a little bit easier once you get to the post-production stage. And that's it, that's all the techniques to scanography. Hopefully that gives you some ideas to play around with your scanner at home and create some interesting images. I'll put some links in the description to some other YouTubers who have made some more creatively themed videos on using the scanner, and this will hopefully be another source to kickstart your scanner journey. Otherwise, hope to see you on the next video. Have fun making some scans and enjoy the rest of your day.